Number 10, farming. In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time, or farming friend time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number 9. Beer Maiden This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of yieldy times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either. But basically, they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma, and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of ye olde times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it if you will, which if you know history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France, it was going rather poor actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in, that's man stuff, you can't do that. Number five. Queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it, seriously. Although I'd certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie. Nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserved, and every girl does, queens just had it better. And that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. Beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course, beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. 
Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about I think. When you guys are cooking chicken for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken, brush a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him. He's a chef. He said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly. Becoming a woman of God was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God, and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then, seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed, staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible, and probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks, and if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. Oh, sorry sister, I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now, ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land. Sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artists. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just It sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, babe. I didn't I see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica, Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. At number 10, Water Carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out to depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often and make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye, hear ye, 
but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 7, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord and served as a Reeve for a one year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits and so they would be given a large ladle and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now, as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the Middle Ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of, and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the Middle Ages, and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently, people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, Cupbearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. 
beverages. The cupbearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cupbearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number two, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale, and they were aptly named Alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business, but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the ale wife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number one, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Traite de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom, and Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child. This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily I would just float near the net tap the ball away like nice try mm. back to prison mm. number eight stone masonry so we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? 
Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stonemasons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This was like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Yeah, they're backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff from growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services, especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on, a three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently, this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, 
or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you the school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you wanna grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully Maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, yeah, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder, go, go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar wacky frantic twist this was long before chubby checker came along so we still have no idea what was going on here like we're out of guesses at this point this twist lasted for months people were dropping on the spot it was scary and confusing in total there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness that's a lot of deaths. That's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up. It's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult. Others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure? Either way, we're all dancing. Number 10, famine. This was not modern times and nowhere close to the industrial agriculture industries we have today. Most folks lived in small towns that were self-sufficient with their farms and animals. After paying up or giving up what they had to their lords, of course, the commoners were not left with much. Men were expected to work all day to provide for his lord, family, and himself. Trouble is, if something even slightly disrupts the farming process, and trust me, there's a lot of factors that would lead to that, uh, then some people are going to go hungry. When people get hungry, they do crazy things. I was crazy once. They locked me in a room full of rubber. Rubber makes me crazy. I was crazy once. They locked me in a room full of rubber. Rubber makes me crazy. Number nine, war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Uh -huh -huh. You guys love that song. I know you do. Picture this. You're a serf working day and night to feed your family. When a town crier brings news to you that your village is going to be under attack and the invaders have been seen coming over the hill just over yonder it's somewhere over there so it's over there the king is sending his best knights to defend the castle but you know like many other folks in many other towns that to protect your family and your stuff your pitchfork is going to need a sharpening and maybe a fire buff 
I, li I like fire buffs. They're cool. Yes, war. The worst invention of mankind. When you think about it, war means you need soldiers, and that means men. Except for a few exceptions, like Joan of Arc. You could throw them in too. Sadly for the peasants, it's a matter of protecting what's theirs. There's no glory in fighting for someone else's glory if it means your farm gets burned down in attack, and then you can't eat, and then no one's hungry, and ah, no good. Number eight, pestilence. In case you didn't know, you probably do, but sickness was an issue for the folks in medieval times, especially if you're a man who's working in the fields or the markets or the public, trying to bring home whatever form of currency is appropriate for the area. You can't do anything if you're sick in bed, or at least that's what I used to tell my mom when I wasn't totally faking a stomachache because I didn't want to go to school. I totally wasn't faking it. I was sick. But a big bug going around at the time in people's tummies was the bubonic plague. Yeah, classic. The big one. Some statistics suggest staggering numbers of people succumbing to the plague. Millions of people and the plague isn't a pretty one. Skin turning black from necrosis, boils, blisters, ugh, it's a bad look. You don't, you don't want it. Number seven, serfdom. While not exactly like YouTube's least favorite S word, it's kind of similar and it sucks. Basically, you're in the lowest of the low in terms of peasantry. You are forced to farm and tend the land that the Lord owns. There's nothing like breaking your back for a guy who doesn't know that you're breaking your back for him. I'm curious, guys. Let me know what's been your worst job and why. I'm, I'm gonna read some comments again in a later video. But yeah, being a serf sucked. Imagine after all that awfulness that you have to pay your boss rent too because you also live on the property that you work. Yeah, not so fun. Pretty messed up. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. Number six, Jester. Imagine trying to write funny and comical things day in and day out until your fingers cramp. And you have to perform your material in front of a bloodthirsty crowd who's just itching to say something the second you make a mistake. Or if you upset the king, it could cost you your head. What a crazy job, right? Huh, I know. However, one jester had it all figured out. The one thing that binds us all together is humans. The type of comedy no scholar or peasant alike can escape. Farting. Yes. Take Roland the Farter, for instance, whose job was to fart. Every Christmas he would show up to the king's place and just let her rip. Boy, do I wish that was my job. Cause honey, let me tell you something. I got some special stuff up in my arsenal. Number five, assassination. Let's say for a second you ain't such a bad guy. Let's say you're a king that everyone likes. You listen to the people's woes of hunger and pain. You distribute the wealth and your fashion isn't too ridiculous for the time. And I'll get to that later because that's, that's definitely a point. You care, which for the time is rare. Well, that's too bad because a lot of men in history, whether they were loved, hated, or something in between, there's always someone lurking around the corner waiting to pour poison in your ear whilst you sleep. Yes, the art of assassination, or at least as I'm told it uh, from ninja movies and Assassin's Creed. Many have and will succumb to an assassin, whether it was for political, financial, or just crazy reasons. It happens, and for some reason, no one ever expects the hidden blades. Well, I know, I know it. And I would never let my guard down for a second to allow that to happen. All right, we're good. We're fine. Just checking. Number four, boiling in oil. Okay, let's just say you got caught in a Shakespearean crime of attempting to poison your king. Something about poison in the ear or something. Oh, do not fear, good friends, because you better call Ched. That's right, your, your internet lawyer. Doctor, fireman too, don't forget that, I'm a doctor and a fireman. I do it all, folks. Well, I'd come to defend you in trial, but this isn't exactly a time for fair trials and innocence until proven guilty. And the opposite. I mean, come on, you got off easy, kid. They're just gonna boil you in oil, it's easy. Roaring flames, big metal pot, and they're slowly gonna dip you in. Won't be that bad. You'll be screaming in pure agony for five, 10 minutes tops. What's the worst that can happen? Well, it'll be the worst pain that you've ever felt in your entire life, but hey, at least you'll look like a Popeye's drumstick later, am I right? Anyway, kid, if you need my legal service again, just uh, give me a call, if you can. I have to go help this bald guy in an RV, something about a lab, I don't know. Good luck. Number three, men's fashion. I know it was a long time ago, but what the heck happened? Calves were in, like big, they like big calves for some reason, I don't know why. I got big calves, you know what I'm saying? And so were Wario shoes, because Wario. As much as I love Wario, since I basically am him, I mean, that doesn't mean I want to look like and feel like him. Longer the shoes, the higher the social status. Weird, right? I know. This was also the era of tunics, and if there's anything I've learned from watching Hollywood movies, and I've learned a lot, it's that you don't trust a guy in a tunic. So, if everyone around you is wearing a tunic, who the heck can you trust? Sheesh, no wonder kings were so paranoid. 
Except for Link, he's cool. We, we, we can trust him. We like Link from Zelda. He's, pre he's pretty sick. As for poor men and serfs, you wore basically whatever you could make or afford, which isn't much. There's no long shoes in the potato fields. I'll stick to my plaid. Lots of plaid. I can't help it, I'm Canadian. Number two, the rack. Ever just wake up one morning and give a big old stretch because it's Saturday morning, you got to sleep in, the sun's shining, and your bones feel warm from a little bit of sun that's just creeping through from the window. You take a deep breath of fresh air and walk downstairs to your fridge to prepare a feast for breakfast, fit for a king. To think of a day like that starts with a stretch. Well, medieval men got to stretch too, thanks to the help of a device called the rack. Think of a ratchet strap, except instead of your dad yelling at you to make sure the trailer's strapped down, you're the strap that's being stretched. Yes, the rack was a means of torment. Basically, your ankles were tied down at one end, your wrists were tied down at the other, and a large sweaty man turns a gear, and then you get stretched out like a pair of jeans you haven't worn since high school. No, that's right, I know. No, you can keep trying them on, but they ain't gonna fit. That's okay, keep telling yourself that, that's fine. Mine don't fit either. Number one, bloodletting. This is just always so weird to me. I, I, I just don't do well with blood at all, actually. I, I got some stories about that, maybe for another day. But basically, there was this medical practice floating around back then. If you were sick, not well, or you just needed to refresh, a medical professional, and I use that term loosely, a medical professional would treat your veins the same way your dad treats a Ford Bronco getting an oil change. Ooh, gross. Did it help? Eh, not really. Am I getting lightheaded just thinking about it? Yes, yes I am, actually. And I, and I mean for real, I, I get lightheaded thinking about it. Not even kidding on that one. For real, getting woozy. Kicking off the list at number 10, together at last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, they had sex, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. 
It's really weird. Go home. Relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches. And as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's Knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes 
sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, Grand Theft Witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Bree mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe. Good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full 
trial. It's wild to look back at a knight and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand. And it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No, thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern. Not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. 
Chasseur de rats. I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or, you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him. So he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like, you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, <sighs> fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh. many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. And this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners, so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe as it were. So not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The gong farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often 
pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The rat trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Kicking off the list at number 10. Farting around. In the earliest accounts of the fool, going back to the 11th century, these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, and right now they're jumping around on tables, telling jokes, doing, doing this shit. It's pretty accurate. It was one of the best jobs to have, this title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have, really. The fool's payment was anything but a joke. Roland Le Petoir was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II as long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. To fart. To literally... He would whistle, jump around, and fart. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table and starts farting all in and around your beans. <laughs> so gross. And then he leave frogs over your head and then goes and heckles your aunts and uncles. I'd be upset. Christmas Day? What are you doing, man? I'm trying to eat beans. Roland the Farter was his nickname. How great is that? He would also whistle tunes in your face. Air would just come out of this guy from every hole. That's impressive. Number nine, expert jugglers. I can't watch circus performers do anything. It makes me way too anxious. Seeing somebody like losing balance 50 feet above a crowd, they're like, oh. Uh, my toes curl, I can't look. While some think of jesters as nothing but these drunk class clowns who would walk silly and talk sillier, they did some crazy stuff. Juggling was introduced early in the fool's game, but like Romans getting bored of gladiators fighting, juggling just wasn't enough anymore. They had to raise the stakes. So jugglers began throwing swords, daggers, battle axes, Anything you don't want above your head, jesters would juggle it in front of you while you're eating beans. While some can't watch juggling, others surely can't take their eyes off of it. This was used as an advantage in battle, believe it or not. Jesters would juggle knives, swords, whatever they could, but while they were doing it, they would talk smack to the kingdom's enemies. They would insult their enemy, basically roast them so hard that they break formation and would try and fight the jester at once. You're gonna fight Leapfrog Larry, who's juggling six swords at the same time? Good luck. They would literally chirp them until they left formation and then at that time, the jester's like, go, I got him. Number eight, key delivery. Being a professional comedian is hard work. You could say a thousand hilarious, well thought out bits, but one ill-timed tweet that goes a little too far can ruin your entire career, apparently. Well, back in the day, being a professional fool was no different. You needed to find the balance of humor and wit, and it was harder back then, if anything, than it is now. Most of these jesters were given role of advisor to the king and queen. That's what makes them so important in history. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, yeah, this is kind of where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them bad news, but in a positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in a naval battle. The British just absolutely wiped them out. It was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester brought this news in a positive way. He gave it a positive spin, rather. He said to the king, they didn't even have the guts to jump in the water like our brave French. Where if that was some random dude, his knees would be shaking. He has to tell the king all this horrible stuff, and he's not used to that. Jesters are used to farting on the king's lap. They're the ones to advise for sure. They're definitely the most comfortable with speaking ill truths. Number seven, bad news. Most of the time, jesters knew their way with words. They were royalty. They were smart, despite what their names make you believe. But sometimes the message couldn't be said with a grin or a pun. Sometimes the king would send these court jesters into battle first to deliver that first message. So no matter what the message was, this jester had to go and deliver it in his jester way. That was the whole point. They would tell a clown to be like, hey, go and tell them that we're going to fight. And he'd be like, okay. Jesters were a treat, but they were also quite disposable, sadly. Sometimes the jester would kick off the entire battle, demanding the opposing side to retreat while roasting them at the same time. It was amazing. It makes sense though. What better way to start a battle? A jester runs across the battlefield. He's like, hey, the king said he doesn't want it anymore. He doesn't want the kingdom. You can have it. We're not even gonna fight. It's all good. It's all yours. Uh, apparently the queen has something called ligma. 
Number six, don't quit your day job. The life of a fool was fun and games, but certainly not all the time. They didn't party all day every day, okay? They weren't the group LMFAO. They had to sleep, they had duties to do. They performed the odd time, but on their off days when they're not juggling knives in front of children, they would tend to household duties, much more daunting than roasting the king in front of his family. They would be assigned to keeper of the hounds. Their hands were quite full during this clown downtime. They would have to travel to markets constantly to purchase livestock for the royal family. They fed the family and then entertained them. A true class act. On top of that, when it came to battle, jesters were the ones to hype up the army the night before. They would play music, tell stories, anything to boost morale. When it came to being on the actual battlefield heading towards battles, jesters would also ride across the front of their army, talking smack about the enemy, you know, still trying to hype them up, even on the day. Number five, business casual. Let's get one thing out of the way. Jesters did not dress like this all of the time. That would be amazing, but let's get real, that would be quite itchy. I don't know, all those tights, can't wash your stuff back in the day. I don't know, I didn't want to get into it. Handling the hounds while wearing jingle bells also, you'd be a walking, talking chew toy. Bad idea. They dressed like normal people, of course. Well, rather they dressed like their masters did. They were hired as businessmen who spoke with purpose, and then when the time came, they would lean into whatever skill that they brought to the table, be it juggling, singing, playing music, whatever. Now, the attire of a jester is what we recognize the most. Their fit was pretty unreal. Their outfit was bright, usually to get attention, but jesters also wanted to dress as comedically as they could. They wore colors that didn't match well together. They wore odd layers overlapping each other, just flaps of jesterness coming off. It grabbed your eye mid-stew. Their headgear was also quite fun. The ears were supposed to be the ears of a donkey. The ears of an ass, rather. With bells, of course, because, you know, they're fun. Number four, all around the world. Contrary to popular belief, the origins of a court jester did not begin with medieval castles or anything in the English days. They were around long before then. In ancient Rome, there were four types of jesters. There were Sanio jesters, who were pretty much mimes. They would make crazy facial expressions, their physicality was on point, they didn't wear masks or say words. Stupid as clowns, great name, did wear masks. They were the full-on clown package. All the ruffles, the hidden face, tall silly hats, big bellies, really creepy, terrifying. I don't like clowns. They would use their riddles to entertain. They would use their words, while the other guys just used their bodies. The Scura jesters were picked solely on their appearance. See, ancient Romans weren't as inclusive or well-mannered when it came to people looking different or having disabilities, so sadly they were hired on their oddities, to say the least. The fourth kind was moriones, is where we got the word moron from. They were the closest thing to our English jester that we have now. They would roast everybody, have a silly walk, a funny talk, and during the festival of Saturnalia, the shortest day of the year, these morons would be the lord of misrule. They would rule the day and tell everyone what to do. It was often a pretty silly time. Imagine an improv teacher doubling down as a dean for the day. Now you get it. Number three, not a trickster. Tricksters, clown, and jesters are commonly mixed up, and honestly, it's that's totally fair. One has a nose that goes bonk, the other dances with jingle bells, and the other plays tricks. It's pretty much the same to us now in our modern days, but tricksters have an entirely different origin than jesters. Jesters came from ancient Roman times. Tricksters from Norse mythology. Hermes, for example, in history, he was considered a trickster of his time. He was the messenger of the gods who also just happened to invent lying. Not, uh, not a good combo. So not only do they go against the rules of their kingdom, but they also go against our laws of physics for the most part. And this has us intrigued still to this day. We're bringing Loki, the trickster, to life. He's fighting the Avengers. He's on Loki season two on Disney+. Plus. It's still going. But back in Norse mythology, Loki was a shapeshifter who supposedly gave birth to Odin's horse. Must have hurt. Over time, the role of a trickster changed, and a lot of these fairy tales, we have trickster characters like Ruffle Stillskin, who'll, you know, pop out of a bush and then make Shrek sign away the day he got married. They screw things up, more or less. That's the trickster. Number two. Jane Fool, one of the few female jesters in history. Here we go. We know about jesters enough now where we can move on to specific people from history. Like Jane Fool, for example. She was included in a royal family portrait. That's a big deal. She's in the background peeking through a doorway. That's pretty creepy, funny, and also pretty epic. She was never trained to be a jester per se, but she was born with the right idea of how to entertain. She was born a comic. She would say what was on her mind. She loved reminding the court that all men were fools before God. She liked to level people, bring them down off their, you know, throne. She would say shit like that, you know, she was great. She was close to King Henry VIII's wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Parr, and rumor has it, 
she was besties with Queen Mary the first. The only person dressed as well as the Queen back then was Jane Fool. And finally, number one, Stanchik. One of the saddest paintings of all time, that of the sad clown. Stanchik. The court jester was working under the command of Sigismund the Old in the early 1500s. Now he was one of the most famous jesters in Poland. He was employed by three different kings. Quite a big deal. So he never lost steam over time, but something did happen. He was considered one of the wisest, and one tale from his time has stuck with many historians. He was often upset with the king, specifically when Sigismund brought in a giant bear from Lithuania and then released it into the wild to later hunt. Sounds like a fun game, I guess. Or, you know, play Guess Who. That works as well. But what happened was the bear ended up hunting the king and even took his queen off of her high horse. Literally, she fell off her horse, was attacked. It was kind of brutal. I don't want to talk about it. Stanchik straight up ran away after this point. He jingled into the night and then everybody talked about him. How could he? He just left. I could have never. <gasps> He ended up defending his actions by saying it's a greater folly to let out a bear that was already locked in a cage. What a roast. A little roast and run. This painting shows the sad jester sitting next to the news that the Splensk has fallen to the Russians. The life of a clown is nothing but sadness, apparently. What a good note to end on.